This is Michael Woodward, and this is episode 241 of Jumble Think. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Welcome to Jumble Think, where we interview amazing entrepreneurs about their journey of turning dreams and ideas into reality. Along the way, we're going to share some tips on how you can turn your own dreams and ideas into reality, too. On today's show, our guest is Kathy Hanoon, co-founder of Dandelion. Whether you're a longtime listener or new to Jumble Think, make sure you go back and subscribe to the Jumble Think podcast. It's easy to do. If you listen on Apple Podcasts, head on over to jumblethink.com slash iTunes. And for Spotify, jumblethink.com slash Spotify. Click that magical subscribe button, catch up on some past episodes, and make sure you never miss another episode of Jumble Think. Now let's jump into today's episode. Hey there, welcome to Jumble Think. My name is Michael Woodward. I am your host. We have a killer show lined up for you today. Today's show is being presented by our friends over at Skillshare, Penji, and OpportunityInChina.com. We're super excited to be partnering with Skillshare, an online learning community with thousands of amazing classes covering dozens of creative and entrepreneurial skills. Top to you by some of the best entrepreneurs and leading thought leaders out there. They are giving our listeners two months of unlimited access completely for free. So head on over to Skillshare.com slash JumbleThink. That's Skillshare.com slash JumbleThink to get your first two months free now. We also want to thank our friends over at Penji. They offer unlimited graphic design at a low monthly subscription. We use them. We love them. They do great design. Go check them out at Penji, P-E-N-J-I dot com. Use the code JUMBLE to get 15% off your first month. And we also want to thank our friends over at OpportunityInChina.com for sponsoring today's episode. Whether you want to learn or teach abroad, they are your connection. They can help you out. Head on over to OpportunityInChina.com to learn more about them. All right, here we go. I am super excited about the show. I said that earlier. I'm saying that now. Jumble Think is all about ideas and innovation. It's about people who are not only having ideas and dreams, but they're actually living it out. They're taking the risk. They're taking the steps. They're innovating. They're changing the world around you. Our guest today, she's doing that. Her company's doing it. She's been doing it for a long time. Her name's Kathy Hanoon. She's the co-founder and CEO of Dandelion, a fast-growing spin-out of Alphabet X. You might better remember it as Google X. Previously, Kathy was the product manager and a rapid evaluator at Alphabet X. Prior to Dandelion, Kathy led a team that created technology to extract carbon dioxide from seawater to create carbon-neutral fuel. If that's not innovation, I don't know what is. Kathy has been recognized as one of Fast Company's most creative people in business, one of Albany Business Review's 40 Under 40, and as a leader of tomorrow. Kathy graduated from Stanford with a BS in civil engineering and an MS in computer science. This is a killer episode, so let's jump in, let's join the conversation, and let's learn about what Kathy is doing to change the world. Our guest today is... Kathy Hanoon, and she's doing some cool stuff with her company company called Dandelion Energy. Kathy, thanks so much for being on. Thanks for having me. Now, tell us a little bit about you and Dandelion and your journey into entrepreneurship. Uh, I'd be happy to. So I started working on the idea that was to become Dandelion when I was working as a product manager and rapid evaluator at Google X, as it was called at the time, or Google's moonshot factory. And then for various reasons, um, over the course of exploring the idea, it became clear that, you know, the idea was well structured to be a startup company. And so we actually took the idea and turned it into a company um, separate from Google and moved to New York and... uh, and we've been at it for about two years since then. So what Dandelion does is we sell residential geothermal systems. So these are renewable energy heating and cooling systems for homes. And one one of the reasons to start here in New York is just that 
of course, people need to heat a lot in the Northeast. <laughs> and the options for a lot of homeowners here are not great. So a lot of people are heating with fuels like fuel oil, which is just another word for diesel. So they have a truck full of diesel that comes and fills up a tank in the basement. Some homeowners are using propane. So a lot of people are looking for a better way. Super cool. We're going to dive into that a little bit. I know that this topic is dear to my heart because I have felt the cost pains of energy in the Northeast myself. Uh, and we'll get into that. We're going to dive into rapid fire questions. So Kathy, are you ready for some rapid fire questions? I guess I am. And the first question is, as a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? Uh, I went through a phase of wanting to be a zookeeper, which is definitely past. And then I also wanted to be an inventor. Super cool. And you're getting to do the second one. Yeah. Yeah. That one went out between the two of them. <laughs> what is one tip you'd give someone with a big idea or dream and they don't know where to start? Um, I think one tip is just don't, don't feel like you have to know exactly what you need to do next or wait for the perfect solution. Just get started with anything. What's one big lie about entrepreneurship you'd like to break? Uh, well, one lie I used to believe is just thinking that entrepreneurs were somehow more qualified than I was or um, had some special experience that let them do it. And now I know you just have to be willing to learn and willing to work hard. And, and that's pretty much it. What's one change you'd like to see in the world? Uh, it would be great if we used less carbon, carbon emitting <laughs> products. <laughs> What do you want your legacy to be? I don't think too much about my legacy, to be honest. Where do you find inspiration? I find inspiration in nature, um, in music, and I think also in looking for elegant solutions to problems. What is one book you think every dreamer or entrepreneur should read and why? One book that I love is The Hard Thing About Hard Things. Yeah. But Horowitz. And why? I think because yeah, it's very, um, he's a great writer. Okay. And he's, he's very uh, wise about business and just the way he writes about it. It's a page turner as well as being a great business book. How do you define success? Um, I think just living according to your values. What is one trend you are currently excited about? I'm really excited about how in the last decade, there's just been so much more diversity in the, the most visible people in society. So when you look at politicians or who's on TV or even starting to become business leaders, there's a lot more women and people of color and people who are gay and just like the, the landscape of people is so much more reflective of people. What is one habit you find helpful in your life as an entrepreneur? Um, going to bed early is an essential habit for me. I'm learning that one myself more and more the <laughs> older I get. <laughs> what is yeah. one thing you wish you would have known when you first started out? Uh, I wish I knew that the value of just thinking critically and independently. And what I mean by that is um, not, not just believing experts are those with more experience unthinkingly, but just the power of being able to ask the right questions and thinking critically to form your own opinions. If you weren't doing what you're doing today, what do you think you'd be doing? Uh, I'd probably be working on another company. And our final rapid fire question, what is one dream you're still wanting to fulfill in your own life? Um, one dream I have is to someday serve as secretary of the interior. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, I think it'd be really fun because you get to go to the most beautiful places and do really useful things um, for our natural resources. I think I, it would, yeah, it'd be great. In a moment, we'll be back with Kathy Hanoon, CEO and co-founder of Dandelion Energy. Today's show is being presented by our friends over at Skillshare. Here's a little bit more about them. Today's episode of Jumble Think is being brought to you by Skillshare. Now, learning is a critical part of success as an entrepreneur, and our friends over at Skillshare are here to help. 
Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of amazing classes covering dozens of creative and entrepreneurial skills. You can take classes in everything from photography and creative writing to design and productivity and so, so, so much more. So whether you're returning to a long-time passion project, challenging yourself to get out of your comfort zone, or simply exploring something new, Skillshare has classes for you. One of the classes I'm excited to take is called Productivity Habits That Stick Using Time Theming. I know I could be more productive and I'm excited to learn through Skillshare how I can make my life as an entrepreneur even better. So join me and millions of other students already learning on Skillshare today with a special offer just for my listeners. You can get two months free. That's right. Skillshare is offering JumbleThink listeners two months of unlimited access to thousands of classes completely for free. To sign up, go to Skillshare.com slash JumbleThink. Again, head on over to Skillshare.com slash JumbleThink to start your two months now. That's Skillshare.com slash JumbleThink. Now let's rejoin our conversation with Kathy Hanoon. We are back with Kathy Hanoon. We're going to go deeper into the story of Dandelion Energy. We're going to talk about uh, her journey of entrepreneurship and so, so much more. But before we get going, there's a question that we have to ask because it's important. And that is, how can people find and connect with you? Um, well, I'm on LinkedIn. So that's one way. Um, and I suppose just through dandelion is another way. So <laughs> I guess one secret of dandelion and probably my company, I don't know how um, happy everyone will be for me to share this, but we're still small enough that first name at company name.com is a pretty good way to find us. Super cool. We'll have links in the episode notes. So if you're listening uh, and we're going to mention this again at the end and you want to connect you should do it because they're really reinventing in a space that is super cool. And speaking of that, let's talk about what you're doing because the whole um, concept of geothermal is an old concept, but it's not an uh, often used concept. So talk to us about what geothermal is and why you were drawn to it as a solution for our current energy state. Absolutely. So, um, when you look at how consumers use energy, of course, transportation is a huge segment and it's the largest segment. So driving around in cars, that's uh, the biggest source of emissions and what most of us do the most when it comes to our energy footprint. But the second, the second highest is I think surprising to some people, which is just like heating and cooling buildings. Um, it's this huge segment of energy use and I think it's one that's relatively, you know, it's not in the limelight in general, especially compared to things like electric cars or solar or wind, you know, there's just a lot more renewable energy out there that gets a lot more attention. So, um, because we heat and cool buildings a lot and generate a lot of emissions and spend a lot of money on it. Um, I started, I guess, this investigation just by trying to understand what would you do? Like technically, if costs were no object, what would you do? And heat pumps are the, the, the solution in the sense that you need to electrify heating and cooling. So in the same way that electric vehicles have taken a car that used to run on gasoline yeah. and all yeah. of a sudden it runs on electricity. So as you clean up the electricity grid with more renewables, you're cleaning up transportation simultaneously. Heat pumps allow you to do the same thing with heating and cooling. So there are systems that run very, very efficiently and they run on electricity, but that electricity is actually used to move renewable energy renewable thermal energy in and out of buildings to heat and cool them. And, and there's two types of heat pumps. There's air source heat pumps, which exchange heat between the building and the outside air. So your air conditioner is an example of doing that. Um, but an air source heat pump could run both ways. So in, in addition to doing air conditioning heat, not with the air, but with the ground. And the advantage of geothermal is that 
when you think about um, the challenge of exchanging with the air in a place that gets really cold in the winter, you're trying to heat your house just when there's the least amount of heat in the air to take, to put in your house. So the heat pump has, the air source heat pump has the hardest time heating right when you need heat the most. And similarly in the summer when you're trying to cool the home, um, the air source heat pump has the hardest time cooling because the air outside is the hottest and you're trying to reject heat from the house into that hot outdoor air. So what a geothermal heat pump lets you do is instead of dealing with the air, which is always the temperature you don't want it to be, you're just dealing with the ground, which is like always about 50 degrees year round. And so that allows you to move heat in and out of the house very, very efficiently. So, you know, this solution I could see was by far the most sort of renewable, energy efficient solution technically. And the problem was very obvious, which is that geothermal systems were very, very expensive. So niche luxury products that only a few people could really afford. And so then the next um, question was obviously, well, why are they so expensive and do they need to be so expensive? And um, we concluded that a lot of the reasons that they were so expensive were not fundamental reasons. It's like a lot of the way that business was structured. So a lot of middlemen in the supply chain and the product was geared towards a very luxury high-end audience. So there was a lot of markup and a lot of emphasis on feature set, um, a lack of standardization. And there just hadn't been a lot of new technology introduced for a long time because the market was so small. So we could see all of these opportunities to bring down costs and make it so much easier and more convenient for consumers to get these systems. And that's been the mission of Dandelion ever since. Super cool. I know for me, I uh, we recently moved and we moved from a house that was a old late 1800s farmhouse. We used uh, natural gas to heat the house. In our winter, our heating and electric bills uh, were around $900 in the summer, four to $500. And uh, it all had to do with it being inefficient to heat and cool our house effectively. And it was so frustrating to spend all of that money uh, on a solution to heat and cool a house where there is a better solution like geothermal available and out there. Yeah, I, I, I think that a lot of homeowners can relate to that. And the thing to note as well is that of all the you know, heating fuels out there, natural gas is by far the least expensive. So yeah. while that bill is still so high, it would be multiple times that if you were in the unlucky position of using fuel oil or propane and millions of homeowners use fuel oil and propane. And so I don't know it, exactly as you're saying, the opportunity to help people, um, get a more convenient solution that's also just a lot less expensive and also happens to be a lot better for society as well yeah. is the uh, is the vision of dandelion. Yeah, absolutely. Now, here's the thing that's interesting to me is that, uh, yes, you're doing geothermal and geothermal has been around for a long time, but you are truly innovating in this space. You are developing smaller, better drilling units. You're creating new technologies in your own technologies. Uh, and and offering not only a, a great solution to consumers, but you're actually innovating in that space and inventing better ways to accomplish what you're trying to do. So talk to us about those that process as a business where you look and say, hey, this is an area we could do better. Maybe it's that creating a new, better drilling unit. Maybe it's creating your own heat pumps. Or, are the different areas that you guys are innovating and evolving the technology into one that's even better um, because of the science that you're using to increase it and make it more efficient or make it more affordable to put in? You know, one of the fun things about having a business in the space that doesn't have too many startups or, you know, too much innovation like home HVAC is that in every place that you look, 
there's opportunities to try new ideas and to potentially improve the way things are done. So exactly as you said, the drilling and the heat pump stand out as very visible examples of where we believe there could just be step change improvements for geothermal, but there are also every day um, just so many opportunities on a smaller scale to improve the process for homeowners because the cost of getting something installed in a home, certainly the product is part of it, yeah. but actually like the work to put it in the home is another really big part of it. And, uh, and one, one thing to realize is because geothermal has been such a small scale industry for so long, there just aren't, you know, it's very different than let's say installing a natural gas furnace in a yeah. house. Tens of thousands, millions of, of natural gas furnaces are installed all the time in houses. And so the process for doing that is uh, very well optimized. That is just not the case for <laughs> geothermal. And um, there's no fundamental difference. And it should be easier to install geothermal in many ways than to put natural gas in. But um, the fact that it's only done hundreds of times a year in New York, for example, instead of millions of times, it just makes there's a lot more to do to to get that process to the same level of um, affordability and convenience and just make it really easy. I want to talk about the origin story for you and the process that you took to kind of go into this space. You mentioned that you were part of Google X or Alphabet X or whatever you want to call it now, I guess. Uh, so tell us a little bit about the process about the discovery of geothermal for you, the process of saying, hey, this is a viable solution. Why aren't we doing this? And then coming to market with it. What was that journey like for you? Well, one of the philosophies that X has is um, you try to figure out why an idea won't work okay. as, as quickly as possible. So, you know, they think in their from their perspective resources are not too limited you know you're in within alphabet um you have access to some of the best technologists and a lot of resources and so opportunity cost is really what you want to limit um and so the way that our process worked is we were encouraged to pursue a lot of ideas to see if they could turn into really giant businesses that um, that Alphabet would eventually want to make part of that, you know, just become part of the Alphabet family. Yeah. But, uh, you know, a lot of things look like a good idea at first, and then you dig a little and you realize, oh, that's why that doesn't work, you know? And so th we were just our goal was to do that as quickly as possible. So we weren't spending too much time on ideas that had fundamental flaws. So how do you figure out in that process, his, this has too many flaws, this one doesn't, and evolve into that iterative phase of, hey, this is viable, let's keep pushing into it. How do you process those decisions? Yeah, it's a really good question because it's such a combination of things. You know, like the reason something might not work in some cases, it could be just a physical impo impossibility, like you just run up against a law of physics, yeah. and that's pretty clear cut. But often it's not that clear cut, because a lot of times <laughs> like you could physically do something, but that doesn't mean it could ever practically work. And um, it's not clear cut all the time, right? Like uh, one of the most famous Google X uh, contributions has been the self-driving car. Yeah. And I think when that project started, that idea is just such a good example of how, how futuristic and impossible does that sound? And there was no fun, there was no technical reason that it couldn't work. And in fact, all the technology trends suggested that it would only become more possible over time as we got better chips and machine learning improved and sensors got better and you know all of these trends and technology sort of suggested that that would become a more and more tractable problem um so one of the projects i did before dandelion was a project we called foghorn internally and it was um 
uh, effort to make carbon neutral fuel. Okay. And that's an example of one where physically you can make carbon neutral fuel and we did it in our lab. Um, it's just what we ran up against is at what cost. Yeah. We ultimately concluded that the level of risk and level of investment you would need to achieve, possibly achieve a cost that would clear, it was just too high. You know, the uncertainty and the risk and the investment was too high um, given the state of the world at the time. And so it didn't make sense to continue to commercialize that project. And so we decided to kill it. And it doesn't mean that 15 years from now, that will be a bad idea. Like maybe that will be a great idea 15 years from now because the world will be different, but it just didn't make sense to work on it now. So I had just come from that project and I was very interested in finding an idea that would work now um, economically because especially with energy, you just need, not only does the product need to be better, but it also needs to be more cost effective to really take off. And yeah, it can, it's not like one or the other. It's got to have the, the both or people are just not going to buy into it. Exactly. And so, um, so looking at fuel oil and heating, um, it was just a great space to find those opportunities because you have the intersection of a very expensive product in the in a product that people generally really don't like. <laughs> you know, like no one <laughs> loves getting their fuel oil tank filled with fuel oil in the winter yeah. so they can burn it with their furnace. Like that is not inspiring delight for customers. So we just saw, okay in that combination of bad experience and expensive experience, there's probably an opening. Yeah. So for you, uh, you could have played it safe and stayed with something that you knew and that something, whether it was staying with Alphabet or Google, if it was Google at the time, wherever you were in that transition, mm -hmm. you could have stayed with the safe path, but you chose to step out and create a co-found dandelion in that process, which yes. I'm sure there's some people that looked at you and go, geothermal, really? Like, hey, this isn't the best financial choice to start a business in this space. There's other options. So how did you go through that process to say, no, this is a fight, this is a battle, this is a technology that I think is viable, and I, I think it's worth the risk to step into it? It was, um, in some ways, it was a very hard decision, in some ways, it was a very easy decision, and what I mean by that, the decision to leave to leave um, Alphabet with the idea to start to start it as a standalone startup company because you're right I had worked at Alphabet for seven years yeah. and I really loved it there like I think it's a great place to work and I felt very comfortable and um, and so in that sense it was very uncomfortable <laughs> to think about leaving but on the other hand I knew it was the right thing and I knew I was going to do it. So it was kind of like one of those circumstances where um, there isn't really a decision. I, I just knew what I was going to do, but I still felt a certain level of discomfort about that knowledge. And I think it was so clear to me just because I believed so strongly in the idea and I believed that the idea would be best structured as a startup company. Um, and I knew in, in theory, like it was the type of thing that I wanted to do. I wanted to, you know, like create a product and create value in that way and have that, um, I don't know, just like create a business and figure all, all the problems out and get that experience. Um, and it, it was just clear that the opportunity was so big and, and, uh, when do you get the chance to, to spin a company out of Google X, right? It was kind of like, if I'm not going to do this now with this idea, I care so much about in these circumstances that are kind of ideal, then I'm just never going to do this. Yeah. And I, I wanted to do it. And so I did. 
Yeah, it's there's a, a guy, he says, uh, the opportunity of a lifetime must be seized in the lifetime of the opportunity. And it seems like that's what happened for you. Saw an opportunity, saw a chance to take that risk. And you just said it's it's too big not to take that risk. Exactly. And then looking back, um, at the time, it felt like a huge risk. And looking back, it feels a little bit less of a risk, to be honest, um, in the sense that um, you know, very easily things could have turned out differently and the comp let, like, let's say the company didn't make it or it didn't last long or something had happened. Um, I think at that moment in time, it wouldn't have been so difficult to go back and get a job similar to the one that I had left or at least similar enough to not make a huge difference in the course of a lifetime. So I think sometimes, um, these decisions can feel very daunting up close, but then when you take a step back, you know, at that time I didn't have, I, I still don't, I, I don't like own property. I don't have a mortgage at that time. I didn't have kids. So it was, it was okay. You know, it was like the right time to do something like that. You are as a business doing something unique in that when let's say my furnace goes out or my HVAC unit goes out, that is not something that I go, Hey, yay, I'm excited. Let's just go out and get a new unit. There's cost there. Uh, there's long-term viability of knowing how, you know, whether it's oil or propane or, or natural gas, how that's going to price that price is going to change over time. You guys are doing something different because often with new solutions, you have to have all the money up front, but you guys are doing a different kind of setup to make it good for your pocketbook today, good for your pocketbook tomorrow, and good for the environment around us. So talk to us a little bit about coming up with that model to make this much more accessible to people. One of the signature characteristics of renewables is that they tend to cost more up front, but then less to operate. And so this is almost always solved by financing innovation. And um, in the case of a residential renewable product, solar really solved this problem for us. So all we had to do is recognize people buy solar often because the cost of their lease or PPA or loan payment on the solar that they purchased is less than their electricity bill. Yeah. So they're able to save money right away, which makes it very attractive. And we've seen that industry grow really quickly. And so we just thought, you know, why wouldn't you do that for, <laughs> for this? It, it was almost like a very, that was a very easy idea because we could just borrow it so neatly from solar. Um, and not only could we borrow the idea, but before solar, it would it would have been hard for us to find a 20 year loan that we could have given our customers for um, this type of product, but solar had really paved the way. So there were there are a bunch of financial products, um, and we were able to just to use that the solar the solar legacy to to get started quickly, which has been great. And I would say there's still, I don't want to overstate it. Like there's so much opportunity to make these products better tailored for geothermal, but, um, we've benefited so much from the fact that solar has figured out a lot of these problems already. Well, we will be right back with Kathy Hanoon, and we're going to continue this conversation about energy, but we're going to go and take a pivot into the personal a little bit more and talk about her uh, experience in the world of technology and the world of innovation and the world of entrepreneurship. We want to thank Penji for sponsoring today's episode. Penji helps startups, agencies, and marketing teams achieve more with unlimited graphic design support at one flat monthly rate. Their easy-to-use online platform pairs you with professional designers and lets you create as many design projects as you want. Think of it as your monthly subscription to top-notch design. No contracts, no hourly billing. Just fast, simple, and affordable graphic design for all of your needs. And they're doing something really cool for our listeners. They're giving you 15% off your first month. All you have to do is head on over to penji.com 
com and use the code JUMBLE, J-U-M-B-L-E, to get 15% off your first month. Again, head on over to PenjiPenji.com. Use that code JUMBLE, J-U-M-B-L-E, to get 15% off your first month. Now let's rejoin our conversation with Kathy Hanoon. We are back with Kathy Hanoon. All right, Kathy, you are leading a really cool company and there aren't a lot of women CEOs out there, although there are more and more and more. I uh, look at Marissa Meyer and our mayor and how she's opened up that door for a lot of women. Uh, and on top of that, you've been doing this while starting and growing and now adding to your family. So talk to us about I'm a guy. I don't completely understand it. I'm married to a wonderful woman, and and she is entrepreneurial in in her own ways. So I, I see that from that standpoint of being one step removed. Talk to us as as a first person experience. What is your experience as a woman in entrepreneurship, as a woman starting and raising a family, and how to navigate that? So the decision I decided um, when I made the choice to start Dandelion to try to keep my decisions about the business separate from decisions about my family and what my family would look like and when to have kids and how many kids to have and that sort of thing separate as much as I could because the decision to have kids is one that really affects your entire life. Yeah. And, you know, and hopefully, it, you know, that – yeah, that decision will like literally shape the rest of your life in a way that I would never want to be in the position where I had sacrificed something so important because of of the business in an early moment in the business. And I think mostly because starting a business is really stressful and a lot of things are very overwhelming and feel very important but it can be very easy to lose perspective. And, and, you know, it's just like, there's so much going on that, um, I could see that I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't compromising on these larger life values and ideas. So we just, my husband and I made the decision. We, we had Evelyn, our daughter, and I'm actually due to have our second child in, in August. So, um, certainly taking on having young kids and doing the startup has been hard, but I think taking on young kids and anything is hard. So it's like, you know, uh, it's kind of one of those things where in some ways she, um, she keeps me focused and forces a certain discipline because, I can't work till any hour at night. You know, I have to be really diligent and thoughtful about how I split my time. And I don't think it necessarily makes me less effective is the thing. Like, I, I don't think, I think, you know, you need, you need a certain amount of time, of course, to be, to be able to run a company. But like, um, how you use that time and how you, the skills of prioritization and really making sure you're focused on the most important problems and how you structure your team. Like all of those things have a greater impact probably, especially as the company grows versus just number of hours. And so it's just forced me to be on a faster learning curve, I would say with some of those things to accommodate the fact that when I'm home, um, she makes sure that I am not working on my laptop <laughs> when she's around. <laughs> super, super. I, I, I completely can relate to that. Uh, it is, I think, a journey worth taking, and it's exciting to hear about more and more entrepreneurs who are, are saying, you know, I'm not going to settle for just buying what I've been told that is the best way to do business. And to hear you share your story of how you're integrating your family uh, into the choices you make, it's a really powerful testament to uh, rethinking how we need to think about entrepreneurship in, our, in America. 
One thing I learned um, a few years ago, somebody told me some people, you know, sometimes you make decisions where you're moving away from the negative. So Mm -hmm. you're responding, your decision is a response to move away from a fear. And sometimes you make a decision where you're moving towards the positive. So making a decision to bring you closer to something you want. And almost as a rule, the decisions that are moving towards the positive tend to be better decisions. And so I think like a lot of people fall into this trap where you maybe delay having kids because you're afraid of the impact it will have on your life or on your career. Or you go to business school because you're worried that if you don't have an MBA, you'll miss out on something, you know, or like all of those things that we do out of obligation to fear. Um, I've just found over time as I compare how I'm thinking about things to that advice that it's a pretty good guide. (laughs) So I try to just, if I think I'm just not going to do something based on a fear, I try to just um, ignore the fear and do it. And so far, it's worked out, like this whole having kids thing, for example. And I think the more you practice it and the more you see it actually does work out, the more bold you are able to become. I love that. That's it's really, really cool. As, as we kind of move towards the end of today's episode, we always like to incorporate a couple questions about the business and direction. So the first question is, is how do you find purpose in what you're doing? Um, one of the things I love about Dandelion is that it's such a purposeful company. So Um, certainly the environmentalism is very meaningful to me. The fact that we're replacing these carbon emitting heating systems with systems, but then also it saves people a lot of money and just helps them feel comfortable in their homes. And then, um, for me, I get to build a business with the values that I have and, and sort of create um, purpose in that context as well. One of the things that's really stood out to me in the beginning, you were talking about, uh, when I asked the the rapid fire question about as a child, what do you want to be when you grew up? And you said either work at a zoo or an inventor. Uh, and there are a lot of people that are concerned about the environment, but there aren't a lot of people who are making active choices to proactively change the environment. Why are you driven towards being a catalyst for change? What was it that sparked that drive to say, hey, this isn't something that has to be this way. I want to make that difference. Well, you know, I think that I've gone through my own personal journey of just the idea of becoming an inventor. It feels very unattainable, Mm. Um, or at least it did to me for a while. Of course, like when I was really young, I was like, of course I'll be an inventor. But then (laughs) as you get older, you're like, well, that seems pretty hard. Like, how does one even do that? How do you make a product? Like, what does that, you know, it's just very mysterious. And starting a business felt that way to me as well. Um, And now, of course, having done those things, I understand it. And I see it's not as inaccessible as I thought. And I think having an impact on these giant problems feels the same way where everyone cares about the environment. Like actually everyone does because we all live in the environment and it's much more pleasant to live in a nice environment. Um, but I think the dynamics are so much bigger than us and it's easy to feel like just the only thing you can do is throw your hands up in the air because the problem's so huge. And, and what, caused me to, to eventually realize that I did want to pursue that goal of, um, making a meaningful difference is that I think I just slowly over time realized that I could, and that was, um, that was really meaningful. You know, I, I think it was a really hard thing to realize though. And now with this perspective, I think like many more people have that potential than realize they have that potential. For you, uh, you are constantly evolving what you're doing to make it better. 
But you have to face challenges all the time. So what's the big challenge that you're currently working to overcome in the business of what you're building? I think for us right now, the, the big challenge at this stage is just awareness. So people generally don't know really what geothermal is. A lot of people associate it with volcanoes. <laughs> and, um, and I think just don't, yeah, I think if people knew that they didn't have to be paying $4,000 a year on fuel oil and they could be paying less for a system that also came with central air conditioning and was renewable and quiet, I think that many people would choose geothermal. It's just how do you how do you educate about this technology that's been so niche on such a broad scale when we're still pretty small as a company. And then of course, like there's not a lot of awareness of dandelion because we're still pretty small. And so this stage of our business awareness is one of our key challenges, but I'm sure, you know, that will change over time, right? It's of course, it's, it's a fitting challenge for the beginning. You mentioned that you relocated to New York because New York uh, is a place that this is a problem that's very real. And uh, for geothermal, are there regions that's more viable and less viable for? Like, would you go, hey, if you're in the middle of the desert, this might not work for you? Or or is it pretty universal that it's going to be a good solution for most people across at least the, the continental United States? I think the way to think about it is going back to that explanation of exchanging heat with the air versus exchanging heat with the ground. The places where it makes the least sense are the places where the air isn't that different than the ground. Okay. And so okay. by that I mean like if you're in San Diego and the weather is always pretty moderate and perfect, then the benefit of having heat exchange with the ground is not that great compared to just having an air source heat pump, um, which is in some ways an easier system to install because you don't have to put a ground loop in under the yard. And in the places that the air and the ground are the most different in terms of temperature over the course of a year, um, geothermal tends to be the most cost effective and just the most um, viable. So certainly the Northeast, but also the Midwest and, um, you know, even places going more into the Southeast that get very hot and then pretty cool in the winter. So I would say most of the continental U.S., it's, it, it is a good choice, but um, the colder and the more seasonal fluctuation in temperature, the better. You're doing a lot. Uh, you have a big vision. What's the next big goal you have for the business? Our next goal is to really operationalize all the R&D we've done on the drilling side. So we've um, been very focused on creating better drilling technology to make it less invasive and just less expensive and easier to put that ground loop into the customer's yard. And this year we're really starting to transition that into a more operational part of our business. That is super cool. What we're going to do is in the episode notes at jumblethink.com, we're going to put links to Dandelion. We're going to uh, put some graphics there that uh, show a little bit of what geothermal looks like from a visual standpoint if you are rethinking energy, uh, you got to check out what they're doing when it comes to your heating and your air conditioning, especially in, if you're in one of those places uh, that's ideal for that, like the Northeast or the Midwest or the Southeast or uh, where you have those climate changes. You, you definitely got to check it out. Before we go, Kathy, uh, I've got to ask a question that's completely off topic, if that's okay. Of course. All right. So you lived in... Uh, the Bay, uh, San Francisco area, I assume, when you worked for Alphabet. Is that fair? That's fair. Yes, I okay. did. I lived in Northern California. I lived up in Chico, so just north of the Bay. And now I'm back on the East Coast. You're in New York, too. Uh, and so my question for you is twofold. One, do you like one of the areas better? And two, how does business feel different or similar between the two spaces that massively impact culture and civilization and and how we do business globally well we are speaking at the very end of may when it has just gotten warmer out in yeah. new york 
So I'm feeling a little bit better about New York right now than I have in the past <laughs> many months. I would say that I, I deeply love California and it feels like home to me and I'm relatively new to New York, but I'm growing to like it. And I think as the summer comes, that will become more and more of a reality that <laughs> my love for New York will grow with the, with the temperature. Um, as for business, one thing I actually really do appreciate about New York and I think um, potentially like more about business in New York is that there's just more diversity of um, expertise, it feels, or professions um, that tend to all be, you know, living and working beside each other in New York City as opposed to the Bay Area, which is so technology dominated. And so um, I think the perspectives here is just like you get a lot more, a lot more diversity in perspective. So I end up spending time with a lot more people who have professions outside of technology. And um, that's been really nice. So while I do, I do sincerely miss the West Coast, I'm enjoying that aspect of New York. As we wrap up today's episode, we always love to leave our guests have the final word. What do you want to leave our audience with today as we wrap up today's show? Um, well, I guess thank you for having me. And I guess one of the ideas that we talked about that stands out to me is just the idea of getting started and not worrying about perfection at all. Mm just taking the first step um, because I know in the past when I've listened to shows like this, maybe that would have been helpful to hear. Super, super cool. Kathy, thank you so much for taking time out. We love what you're doing. We're becoming big fans here. Uh, Jumble, think of what you're doing as we learn more about you and we're, we're cheering you on and say, you know, keep going for it. Uh, and, and we're excited to see how you impact and change the world in the this one area and beyond that as you grow uh, in your journey forward with entrepreneurship and other things that you do too. Thank you so much. In a moment, we'll be back for some final thoughts. Ate Hanoon has been a lot of fun and I wanted to give you a few takeaways that I personally took away from today's episode as we wrap up today's episode. The first thing is that with Kathy, we can look at her story and see that you have to leave what you know and step into the unknown to chase those entrepreneurial dreams and ideas. For Kathy, that meant leaving Alphabet or Google and leaving her job where she knew what it looked like. She knew how it was going to operate. She knew that she was safe there in uh, having a job and having security and step into the unknown and create her own path with creating Dandelion. I'm sure that just like Kathy, for you, you have to make some changes when you step into that unknown. You have to leave some things that you have known and celebrated and relied on for years when you're making that step. But one of the things you can do in making that decision is to make sure you leverage as much as you can to set yourself up for success. Well, what does that mean? That means that you can uh, do the research before you step into that unknown. That means that you can take micro steps before you go deep into chasing those dreams and ideas so that you can maybe do a side hustle or maybe you can have another co-founder or other people around you that know the path to this success and you can take those steps on that journey. So just like Kathy, when you have a dream and idea, you are going to have to leave something behind. Something's going to have to die for the new idea and dream to come alive. And, and so for you, as you've listened to today's episode, I would encourage you to step back and think about it. If you have a dream and idea, what, what is it going to cost you to get to the future? Maybe it's just stepping into that unknown and taking that risk and, and being okay with stepping into the fear to move forward. Or it might be that you have to leave a comfortable job because your side hustle is growing and, and to really get to the next level, you have to fully be in on chasing that dream and idea. So whatever that is, 
take stock of what's happening right now in that process of ter chasing your dreams and ideas and turning them from dream and idea into reality. What is it that you have to leave? What is it that you have to step into in the unknown to make that a reality? The second lesson that I took away from today's episode is when you chase your dreams and ideas, you, you get to choose what's important to you. For Kathy, she made decisions not only to create Dandelion, but she also made decisions on how that would impact starting a family and growing a family. So when you have the power of your dreams and ideas, you get to put into practice and you get to put priority on what is significant to you. And that's a powerful place to operate from. Because when you set your values, when you set your standards, you can say, hey, no, we're not going to change X just because somebody tells us to because we value something different and we're going to do it a different way. Or if your family is important to you, you can say, hey, you know what? It's 5 o'clock. I'm shutting the doors to the business. I'm going home to see the kids. We're going to go to the ball game. We're going to uh, go play in the backyard. But whatever it is, you can say, you know what? I value something different. And you can set those parameters so that you can create the lifestyle you want. And so in this episode, Kathy talked about what it looks like to create a family and also to create a business at the same time. And we can learn so much from what she's sharing there about those dreams and ideas and how your values become your own when you chase those dreams and ideas. And the final takeaway I wanted to share with you today that I took away was just because something has been done before doesn't mean you can't do it a better way. The geothermal space has operated for years, and Kathy has chosen to create in that space, but not to accept the way everyone's done it. She's figured out ways to create better units to create better tools like the drilling tool to make it more affordable to the end consumer. They've looked at different ways of making financing possible to make it accessible for consumers. And just because something has been done a specific way, if you're creating in that same space, doesn't mean you can't innovate in that space. There are so many industries that could have learned from that philosophy of saying, you know, we're not going to accept the status quo. Look at the newspaper industry. What could they have done to innovate and change instead of saying, hey, we're going to do it the way we always did it because it works, and now they don't exist because they didn't evolve and change? Or let's say the publishing industry and how books are distributed and how people read their content and engage with their authors that they love. That's changed, and the publishing industry has struggled to keep up with that. Or maybe... You're in a small business, and you are an automotive owner. You own a, a garage that works on cars. What could you be doing to change how the industry works? Maybe you have better uh, training for your employees. Maybe you have better perks for them, better user experience for your customers who are coming in to interface with having their car fixed at your shop. You could be evolving and changing the status quo in that space to create a better experience for those around you, for creating a better product or service. So for you, whatever that is, step back and think about how can you evolve? How can you innovate in your business? So my three takeaways, you have to leave what you know to step into the unknown to make those dreams and ideas a reality. My second takeaway when you chase your dreams and ideas, you get to choose what's important to you. You get to set your values. And three, just because something's been done a specific way doesn't mean you have to follow that same path. We want to thank our sponsors for today's episode, Skillshare. When you want to learn, if you are curious like me, this is the online platform to help you learn the things you need. Head on over to Skillshare.com slash JumbleThink and get two months free when you sign up right now. So head on over to Skillshare.com slash JumbleThink and sign up. We also want to thank our friends over at Penji. They're offering you unlimited graphic design at a low monthly cost. Head on over to Penji.com, use the code JUMBLE, and get 15% off your first month. We also want to thank OpportunityInChina.com. Whether you want to learn or teach abroad, they are the place to go. Head on over to OpportunityInChina.com to learn more. On Friday's show, we're talking about the art of simplicity in entrepreneurship. It's going to be a lot of fun. Make sure to check out Friday's episode.
Well, thanks for tuning in. Let's connect. Head on over to jumblethink.com and find all of our links to social channels and sign up for our newsletter. And it's your turn now. Get out there, chase those dreams, and change the world around you. Les mères de famille, les enfants, peuvent également prendre un moment revitalisant dans quelques mois. Lorsque vous aurez bien saisi la technique et que vous serez maître de votre corps, vous pourrez vous décontracter même en travaillant.